Thank you so much for coming here today. Uh, my name is Siobhan Hebron, and we are Patient Experience. Uh, so our collective currently consists of 10 artists, and we're all based, or mostly based in the greater LA area. And each one of us has a long-term, chronic, serious, and or rare illness. Um, so essentially, we are artists with illnesses, but more specifically, and I think what makes us unique, is that we are making work about that experience of illness. Um, so we officially formed in late 2014, and the way that that came about was that four months earlier, I was diagnosed with essentially an inoperable brain tumor, um, or brain cancer, if you will. And during this process, I found myself really struggling for support. Um, and that wasn't because I didn't have it. I had tons of family and friends around me. Um, I found myself thinking about my entire experience in kind of more creative and artistic ways. Um, you know, my interactions with medical staff translated into performances, and I wanted to make sculptures out of all my hospital paraphernalia. Um, so I reached out within the artistic community for empathy for this kind of niche intersection. Um, and I sent this message to the few artists that I knew at the time who were making artwork about illness um, that I was aware of. So we got together, and it was immediately obvious from our first meeting that there was so much to talk about and that a dialogue really, really needed to happen. Um, we realized kind of the dearth of resources for us, but also the breadth of material surrounding the idea of creative, critical, and active engagement with illness. So that's what we've been working towards in the last year or so. Uh, we put on an exhibition in 2015 called Side Effects May Include Art, and um, <laughs> several of us participated in a performance at Perform Chinatown, which is an annual performance art festival that Los Angeles has. Um, and we also put together a document titled How to Talk to Sick People, which is the flyer that Nicole mentioned, and we've got that um, out back by the food, and you're welcome and encouraged to take one. Individually, we've all been involved in multiple projects since starting um, and had personal milestones, both art and health related. Um, and I am incredibly honored to know and continue the conversation with all these amazing and inspiring people. And um, I think we're all making work that is life affirming for us as artists, but also hopefully working towards shifting what I think is a highly problematic um, current sociocultural perception of illness. Um, so that's what we really want, a dialogue. We want an honest discussion. We want to foster a non-myopic view of illness. We want to have agency and to be part of integrative treatment for ourselves as well as others. And we want to encourage empathy from doctors as well as the general public. Um, so I know time is short, but now that you have kind of a rough idea of who we are and what we do as a collective, each of us is going to individually come up and tell you a little bit about themselves. And then if we have any time at the end, we can answer some questions. Hello, my name is Bettina Hubby. And uh, let's see, two years ago, um, this April, I had a double mastectomy for um, stage one breast cancer. And I started doing art about my illness pretty much the day before surgery. I put out a call onto Facebook because I started to get um, a real panic feeling about how people were going to react to um, my news. And I am um, in an artistic community, and I had already started to get a lot of um, really sad messages. And I realized that I had control to turn that into something that would fuel my recovery. And what I needed was laughter and, and happy feelings, and feelings of a supportive community, not a bunch of sad, pitiful emails about, oh, I'm so sorry, this and oh, this makes me so sad. So I put out um, a call for boobs, images of boobs, poetry, songs, and I just said, don't, don't give me any pity, I just need boobs. And so I got uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of emails and images and texts uh, of boobish things. And, um, and the day after I woke from surgery, um, it ac actually transformed my healing experience into something very, very positive. I was smiling every day, laughing with my mom. We'd pull up Facebook, more boobs. Uh, it just was, was such a good move. But it was also very frightening. 
Um, I went on to put on a show with 125 artists, um, boob-related artwork, and we raised um, a lot of money for breast cancer research. Um, then when I met this group, I was also struck by the amount of advice people give you when you're ill. Um, they are very well-meaning, I'm sure, but um, a lot of that advice can become also kind of overwhelming and a negative experience. So I did these collages based on each of these artists and all the advice that they got during um, and continue to get throughout their illness. And this one artist, which one is this one for? That's mine. That's yours. <laughs> Daniel, get over it. Um, not helpful. <laughs> Stay present. Yes, great advice. Walk it off. Um, eat tree bark. There's lots of very healthy tree bark out there, I'm sure. But don't tell anybody to eat it if they're sick. <laughs> it doesn't help. And smoke weed. And I know that, that there's a lot of amazing research being done about um, the effects of marijuana on cancer, etc. And these are all very, each individually is kind of amazing. Some of the advice is super useful. But be very aware how your advice might hit somebody who's going through a lot and receiving a lot of advice. Um, here's another one. Oh my god, it's like you're on vacation. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> you know, uh, being in recovery and going through illness throughout your life is, is, is not a vacation. And, um, you know, there are different ways to be supportive. Um, just be aware of how this kind of advice is hitting people. You know, fish oil, seriously, just fish oil. It'll be your saving grace. And here's another one. Um, when people ask you how you feel, always say good. And then, if you just have taken some herbs, you could have avoided the whole thing. Um, and a lot of these people aren't ill at all. And they've read a book or they read an article online. And it just, I'm just asking all of you, because you're in training, to be in a position where you could actually help us in a holistic way, treat us like full-bodied people that need your care mentally as well as physically. And uh, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Daniel Layton, and uh, I have Crohn's disease, and I've had an ileostomy for uh, about three decades. And, uh, I make art to address aspects of my illness uh, beyond just the physical, although it does impact the physical, um, primarily the emotional aspects and the trauma I, ex I experience. Um, this slide, this is a piece I did called Crohn's Layer Cake, and this is used by uh, the director of uh, an IBD um, foundation. And she point, uh, presents this to gastroenterologists all over the world. And after every talk, she gets stopped uh, by, one, by doctors who come up to the, her and say that uh, this was the most powerful slide they saw. And um, the reason they tell her that, the reason they say that is because three quarters, three layers of the four, of the four layers of the cake are non-physical symptoms, psychosocial, emotional symptoms. Um, and what's interesting is she gave a blank one of these to a group of kids with IBD. Of, you know, so they could fill it in themselves. And they all filled it in in that same ratio, where 75% of the, the issues that they were struggling with were not physical. So I think when, when I went to the hospital, I mean, over I had six surgeries, and a lot of it's just looking at the scar and seeing, is that healed? But there's a whole lifetime of healing the, the other aspects of the illness that go along with it. This is a slide, this is a painting called Shame. Uh, this is, I was 11 when I uh, got my ileostomy. And so I was in sixth grade, and I went back to school, and this is the feeling that I had going back with, you know, my intestines sticking out and a bag of feces hanging from my stomach um, with a bunch of other 11-year-olds, like an outsider, like an alien. Uh, this piece is called Tied Up at the Hospital, 
Um, I was, uh, when I was five years old, I was taken into, I was in the hospital, and I was wheeled into a room without being told anything, without really good communication about what was about to happen. And I fought, I fought the nurses and doctors off because they're just trying to shove something into me. And um, as a result, they tied me up so I couldn't move. So this portrays the, uh, like the, the yellow figure in the right corner there is, is sort of the emotions leaving my body and dissociating, me dissociating. I made a, an augmented reality app. So um, what that does, as this video shows, when you put the app up to the painting, it, it displays video and sound and animation, a little bit of interactivity to uh, get deeper into the trauma, the emotions, the, the struggle to reconnect with yourself, with myself in this case, and the whole emotional journey. And that's it. Thank you. called chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. Um, I'm not sure a lot of you have probably heard of this version, but I'm sure you've heard of osteomyelitis in general. Um, it is thought to affect around one in a million people. So a lot of my struggle is not only just dealing with the pain of having my body attack my bones and create holes in them, but um, also dealing with the fact that a majority of my doctors, probably 90% of my doctors, do not um, know about my disease. So it's kind of weird to be the one teaching them, and it's uncomfortable. Um, I started um, thinking about agency, like the power and the responsibility of having a disease, the responsibility of taking care of myself once I turned 18 and had to deal with all of this on my own, the responsibility of teaching my doctors what my disease is and how to treat it. Like, it's really, really strange walking into a doctor's office and having them ask you what to prescribe you. Um, it's not cool. <laughs> I could, like, ask for anything and they would give me it, but of course, like, I just, I just want to get better. So, um, I started making little paintings and drawings uh, to try to visualize the pain because I really want to take agency over the pain itself. Um, a lot of that uh, involves this kind of battle in between my brain and my body. Um, like Daniel was talking about, there's a lot of uh, emotional kind of attachment you get to your pain, and you start seeing it as a part of yourself. But um, at the same time, if, if you view it as a part of yourself all the time, it's really hard to recover, it's really hard to get better. So um, I started kind of illustrating those feelings for um, other people with chromo and other people with bone problems to uh, try to relate to them. Um, I made a video piece called I Am Not My Illness in which I uh, wrote and repeated out loud I am not my illness on myself until I was completely covered. For me that was um, a really good way to kind of, again, work on agency and work on um, kind of just taking responsibility for the illness without letting it totally define who I am, because it doesn't define who I am. Um, it's really hard not to be passive sometimes when you are dealing with an illness. Uh, for example, Sometimes you want to go to the doctor and just have them do everything for you. They give you a lollipop, you walk out, and you're happy. But uh, for me, especially because my disease is so rare, um, I sometimes kind of blur those lines in between illness, person, doctor. There's, there's a lot of um, kind of weird subjective things I have to deal with. And that's it. Hello, my name is Dominic Bolliazzi. Um, as you can see, I'm 
see on the side here, I have cystic fibrosis. Um, you probably wouldn't tell that normally if I didn't tell you that. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this dichotomy of public versus private with respect to illness and um, the, the notion of invisible disease and having something going on inside your body that you deal with that, don't have, that doesn't have any real outward uh, vis visible signs. Um, I was born with cystic fibrosis genetic disease, you probably know of it. Uh, I was diagnosed at birth. Uh, I'm now 33, eight months post double lung transplant. So, thank you. Um, so the work I'm going to show you was all done pre-transplant um, within the last four years. I, waited, I was on the waiting list for three years. Uh, I ended up getting it at Stanford, but I was listed here and at Stanford. So for, for two years of my life, I, I was on oxygen and I had those outward visible signs of being sick, a sick person, carrying an oxygen tank. Um, my weight was really poor. Um, so the interest to me was the, you know, the, the difference between the, the private issues that I face with treatment, hospitalizations, uh, interactions with doctors and clinics versus how I was perceived in public uh, before and after being on oxygen. So I'm going to show you some performances I've done. This first one, you, you guys might have been to LACMA and saw uh, Urban White I Urban Lights by uh, Chris Burton. So this piece, I was on uh, home IVs for about a month, and I wanted to just do something in, in the public and kind of bring the, the visibility of disease into a public sphere, and also use some kind of backdrop uh, that was kind of iconic, something that people could could visually recognize. So uh, I go to LACMA often, and this piece is very iconic, so I thought I would make one of the urban lights an IV pole. It's kind of like a little bit of a pun there, but um, I thought it would be a good way to kind of strike up a discourse with people that are in the public sphere, and that, that piece is uh, photographed often. There's a lot of people that go there. So I went there, I hung a bag of tobramycin, gave myself the infusion, and I sat there for the 45 minutes as it infused. And during that time, people came up and talked to me. And it was a great way to kind of break down the boundaries of the stigma of illness, and there was a lot of questions. And a lot of times, when I'm dealing with these performances in public spaces, um, taking these private actions of treatment into public spaces, I get uh, a lot of people that are willing, more willing to share their own medical experience, their own history. Um, so it's like this, this give and take, this dialogue that I think is really important for people to have. Um, so this next piece, I kind of reversed that dichotomy. I brought the public into my hospital room. This is Keck Hospital, 8th floor. One of my performances, I, I, it's called The Hospital Show. I had made about 12 paintings, small paintings, while I was inpatient. And then for two days I held a gallery show, so the work, I hung the work. It's on the wall here. And the work is about like these based emotions that go on during hospitalizations and um, fear, blood, all these things that you kind of deal with, the emotions and, and stuff. So I hung the work. People came in. They would, I put out a press release and everything. And it was really great to have people come in and see the difference between their experience viewing art in a museum or gallery setting versus viewing it in the hospital and the, the similarities, the sterility, the, the white walls, the kind of quietness that goes on. And again, it created this dialogue. And, um, and so this last piece I'm going to show you um, is a performance I did at a performance art festival, Perform Chinatown. And basically I'm looking at the apparatus of the medical equipment that I use and using that for art making. And this, I just do these daily treatments of airway clearance and nebulizers. I do it four times, a, I was doing it four times a day at home. So I just took that and did that on a public sidewalk in Chinatown. So I'm gonna just play a little bit of this video. And... 
were like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best reaction, so I like that. Uh, Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is SK, and I have ulcerative colitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and post neuropathic neuralgia, um, or nerve pain. <coughs> so um, I'm going to try to do diligence by our time restrictions and get right to it. I'm saying I lived my entire childhood in a pretty blissed out world. So when I got ulcerative colitis at 19, it hit me pretty hard. The reality check had arrived and it wasn't pretty. It was actually really disgusting. I grew up comfortably middle class with caring parents and a first grade teacher mom, probation officer dad, the white picket fence, the basketball hoop in the driveway, Brick Lake Porch, Orange County, the whole shebang. I was always active and very social and one of the outside kids. The captain of the tennis team, photo editor of the newspaper and on ASB, um, a love for literally almost all food started early, and my scrawny stature left me oblivious to limits, so when I could no longer eat almost everything except for rice and chicken um, for five years, um, I didn't feel really like myself, so I felt as though my identity had disappeared. Overnight, I became the picky eater, the Sally to all my peers, Harry, at restaurants, which I realized when writing this that maybe you, hopefully you know the reference <laughs> to <laughs> the romantic 80s uh, movie. Um, it wasn't until I go, went to go into a mission uh, after six years I began to make work about my best kept secret. In hindsight, I don't think I ever felt like it was an option to turn my focus so deeply personal, but it quickly came up when I found myself in an intimate class of five friends and a trusted teacher with Crohn's. I felt comfortable with my close peers to broach the subject, and that resulted in a series, one of which is UC3, <coughs> which is here, an installation I did for the downtown LA Art Walk in 08 with another based LA-based art collective, the LA Art Girls. Here I created an interactive installation with the audience who were welcome to walk into a door which led them through a tunnel in the shape of a colon lined with hundreds of balloons, which was glowing from the outside, as you can see glare, with a commissioned score playing, um, all to simulate ulcers inside a colon, the full ulcerative colitis experience. <laughs> and then I made a joke about the Jimi Hendrix experience, but then I decided to. <laughs> um, selfishly, I wanted people to see that this was real, visible, and serious. Those bulbous balloon ulcers were impossible to avoid in their obnoxious abundance. They were going to touch you and make you feel something. Basically, my approach was go big or go home. People thought it was beautiful and playful with countless return visitors. Kids would literally not leave the tunnel. Um, the joke was on me. Such a positive and joyous experience and response was eye-opening, inspiring, and such a pleasant surprise that I remember thinking, what was there to stop me? And enter chronic fatigue syndrome, or CFS. Just days before the closing of that show and two years after going into remission from UC, I found myself mysteriously sick with another suspected bout of shingles and felt bedridden nearly overnight. Six doctors and two months later I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Best described, it felt like I had ran a marathon they didn't train for with the worst flu imaginable and then multiply that by any number over 10. And this new illness made UC seem like child's play. With the fatigue I found myself with post neuralgia which gave me chronic nerve pain and limited use of the right side of my body. Since I could not operate my heavy camera and was immobile close to 24 hours a day, I felt a kinship with my bed. The sheet series, which I made with my iPhone in bed, my own take on an Edward Weston, who was a prominent photographer of the early 1900s, um, and his study of clouds. <clears throat> this experience of the external world being lived by everyone else in my own internal world gave me a voice and something to show for my lack of employment and social life. The complete absence of physical symptoms or markers are what makes this illness so controversial and can really drive a person crazy. The suicide rate associated with this mysterious syndrome is frightening. 
And that brings me to my final series, my next project, the I Am OK series. One of my danger, danger, what I call, um, coping skills is telling myself I'm OK, I'm OK, I'm OK, I'm OK, and I kind of meditate. And with not being able to write with the nerve pain on the right side of my body, with my writing hand, I had to teach myself to write with my left. And so it was kind of like on a mission. And so with the idea of the old school templates I learned to write in the 80s, another dating myself. Um, thankfully, the nerves were repairing themselves, albeit eight years later. So I'm so grateful to have an outlet, and I feel like I have a voice. Um, so for me, art acts as a, conversa a conversation starter, um, because I otherwise wouldn't know how to begin. And I also like really cheesy quotes. And so my favorite is Theodore Roosevelt, do what you can with what you have where you are. I'm sure a lot of people up here can relate to that. So thank you. Hi, my name is Dylan Trumbull. Um, I'm going to be 24 at the end of the week. Um, and about a year and three months ago, I had a brain tumor that was surgically removed um, in Arizona. And when I got back to, uh, I live in Irvine, so when I got back to Irvine, I uh, wanted to kind of explain what was visually happening to me. So which I still have right now, diplopia, which is double vision. Um, so when I was in Arizona in the hospital, uh, my surgeon and therapists and doctors came up to my parents and said that um, I'll have diplopia and think about it being resolved in years and months, not days and weeks. Um, so when I came back to Irvine, I really wanted to share this with people, what I'm seeing through my eyes. Because it's something that, you know, you walk down the street and people don't know what you see. You go to an optometrist and they have no clue what you're seeing. So um, I started off by doing this project and uh, I was taking pictures at, um, you know, my physical therapist, my vision therapist, uh, speech. Um, I was in a brain tumor support group, um, yoga, and uh, because my balance was really off. So again, I wanted to take pictures uh, for stuff that um, I had to go to in result of my surgery um, over a week. And uh, so I came out with this. Uh, the next one is also a diplopia thing. Um, so I did uh, a photo a day of diplopia. And uh, what I decided to take was um, pictures of acti activities that I did um, that I thought were challenging because I saw two of things. Um, so this is just uh, a few of many images, uh, you know, driving, talking to people, working out, um, climbing over rocks. It's really hard when you see two of things because you kind of have to guess between, you know, which eye is creating the image, so you kind of go in between and go for in between both images. So um, that's that project. Uh, the next one I did uh, was actually from my senior uh, exhibition in undergrad. And um, I did, uh, on the left was before the operation, on the right was after. Uh, and. I came home and I kind of came back to Irvine after the surgery and I had this, uh, this thought of, I have, you know, I'm, I'm a new Dylan and I have to figure out um, what the new Dylan's strengths are and weaknesses were. And so when I um, thought about it, I was like, you know what, I, I could still take pictures. I'll still do exactly what I was doing a couple of months ago. And uh, besides it taking me a little longer, um, it really, I, I didn't think that there was much difference. Uh, so to explain a little bit, because this is not a waterfall or a bridge or a flower. Um, so these images, uh, what they are, are if you know you have friends that write their name with flashlights in the middle of the night with like an open camera. That's what essentially this is. So I go down in my garage at night and I take pictures of uh, plexiglass and light. So I put light behind plexiglass. And to me, it's kind of like a digital painting. 
so I make a composition of, uh, of, you know, out of the plexiglass, and I just make uh, different gestures of these plexiglass, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I wore my I poop today shirt. It's actually the shirt lies. I took a bunch of emodium in preparation for this talk, so I won't be pooping for a while. Uh, I'm Sydney Snyder, and I'm going to be presenting on humor today. Um, humor is really important to me and my art practice, but it's also something that brought us as a group together. Um, something we bonded over instantly when we were sharing stories. I like to say that we share a lot more laughter than we do tears at our meetings. Um, I started making work about humor after recovering from a year-long battle with refractory C. diff. Um, that was eventually cured by a successful fecal microbiota transplant. And normally here I'd explain what that is, but I'm guessing a lot of you guys know what it happened to you. I'm seeing nods. Um, <laughs> so I found, I was reflecting on my time with C. diff after um, while I was recovering, and I found that one of the best ways my family and I connected throughout this time and were able to talk about um, <clears throat> the, what was going on with me through all the trauma and the fear was humor when you had a lot of poop jokes. It was much more difficult to talk to friends and coworkers about what was going on. People don't love to hear about your incessant diarrhea. Um, and that wasn't an issue until I started to look sick and had to start taking off of work. So I decided that we needed a kind of forum to talk about the more stigmatized aspect of, aspect of illness. So I started an online uh, social media based project called Poop Jazzle. That's on, that can be found on Instagram. And um, I knew I would want to use humor to kind of open up a dialogue about poop and illness. Um, I post a variety of content on there. I definitely recommend you guys <laughs> check it out maybe sometime while you're actual... <laughs> This is an actual quote. Um, conversation I had with one of my doctors at UCLA. Don't worry, it won't be um, Another piece I did, my last colonoscopy, which was last April, I decided to post about my bottle prep live on, on social media. So I invited people to join me and posted um, recipes for colotinis, which is a, a cocktail made with bottle prep solution and a variety of clear liquids that are on the allowed list. Um, and I shared these recipes and photos, and um, I made this ad. <laughs> For a movie prep, they have not yet reached out to me <laughs> for sponsorship opportunities. But um, I've had an overwhelmingly positive response to this work. I have um, my parents' friends and my friends' parents always contact me before their first colonoscopy um, just to talk. I found that people are more comfortable talking to me than they are their doctors. So I think humor can really be something that you guys could use. Um, to just put people at ease during a scary time. Um, I know I turn to humor as a defense mechanism and a coping mechanism. Um, I was fortunate enough to have a doctor that performed my FMT that I really connected with, um, with humor. After my FMT, I um, sent him a thank you card from the bottom of my colon, and a year later, I designed this FMT card and sent it to him. Um, he still has it in his office, displayed prominently. And after seeing it, he actually had me design stickers um, so that he could put um, the little blender plus poop equals sparkly shiny rainbow colon um, on paperwork for his uh, seat of patients who were just as, um, just as down and out as I was when I went to see him. Um, so now his paperwork that gets handed to his seat of patients has this pretty sticker on it. So I think it's a way that um, people can really uh, come together and talk about things that are hard to talk about. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I have Gaucher's disease, and I'm in sort of a 
slightly different situation than these guys because I grew up very, very sick, but Western medicine came through for me. And there's now enzyme replacements and joint replacements. So my life is really pretty normal except for some fatigue. So I've had a lot of transition in how my life has worked. So this is the kind of work I did when I was still sick before I had my hip replacements. And it really represented being sort of compressed in an area, um, being isolated, not being able to, to really do what I wanted with my body. There were, there were restraints about drug pricing and all sorts of things like that. And I did a lot of work about myself because as you see from everybody here, when you're sick, you're really focused on yourself. And that, for a lot of people, becomes their main artistic motivator. So then when I started on the enzyme replacement, everything changed about my artwork. And it wasn't a decision that I thought about. It just all of a sudden, my color palette was brighter. There were multiple people. Things became very sort of erotic, very sensual. I started bringing in the out, outside world into my life. So now what I do, the majority of my work, I still paint um, because I think of myself as a painter, but I do work about other people's scars. And I, people come to me from all over the world, literally, they, they write me, they say, I'm in LA, can, I, can you do a print of my scar? And I do monoprints off their bodies, and I sort of go into the prints to try to give the narrative to their story. This is a woman in Ireland, I just had a show in Ireland, who had her leg lengthened. So if you look at this print, it's a print on the bottom of, the, of her stump, and then the length of her leg, and you can see where the ink is on it. But up on the top, I've shown the area that was lengthened. So each of these prints on its whole is just a piece of art, but it also tells a story. And what, what's happened over the years is people come to me just as everybody comes to these people. And what I try to do is tell their stories and give them a voice. And when I show these artworks in a gallery, everybody looks at everyone's story, like you're looking at these guys and thinking, wow, these, these people are survivors. Everybody's a survivor. And I think you can tell from looking at this whole group that if you keep a good mood about your life and everything you've gone through, in a way, it can make you really stronger. These, Everybody in this group is using this situation that they've been dealt, whether it's genetic or that came to them later, as a motivation tool to produce really positive things to explain their stories and give other people's voices. So you're going to find a lot of your patients over the years are going to, they're going to be really down when they're going through the treatment. But once they survive it, you get this group, which is an incredibly strong, great group of people because they have lived through it and they want nothing but to help other people live through it. Thanks. Uh, hi again. Um, so as I mentioned before, I uh, got brain cancer. Uh, more specifically, I was diagnosed with a low-grade diffuse tectal astrocytoma um, in June 2014. And long story short, I had a debilitating headache for five days, and an urgent MRI was scheduled, and two hours after that, I got a call from the doctor saying to go to UCLA emergency immediately. Um, I was in the hospital for 12 days, had two surgeries, and since then, I have completed a six-week course of combined radiation and chemotherapy, and I'm currently going through chemo as well. And in two weeks, I start my last of 12 rounds. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and this has all happened in about the span of 18 months. And this is after 24 years of completely healthy life. I've never even been in a hospital. Um, so unlike some others here, this has been a bit of a whirlwind romance for me. And I've taken to calling it being T-boned by life. Um, so it's been a tremendous amount to process, even with art as an outlet and a great support system. And these are two pieces of drawings 
which are really just enlarged notes that I had written in trying to process my situation at the time. And they thus illustrate what I'm thinking about and this idea of excess. So between um, you know, digesting just the actual information, the stay in the hospital where you're covered in monitors and nurses and residents are in every five minutes, and the exhausting follow-up meeting with oncologists and neurologists and radiologists and getting labs done, doing scans, taking pills, getting MRIs, dealing with insurance and pharma companies, updating and consoling family and friends. It's exhausting. Um, and um, this is a piece I did in response to kind of the general positive thinking mantra that gets spewed at you by people. Um, but, you know, uninformed, ignorant, kind of preachy cliches like this are really not helpful and kind of just more detritus that you have to deal with. Um, so I've really just found it to be such an excessive lifestyle. Um, and that's what I keep coming back to as the main concept to almost all the art that I've um, done and am doing. And this is a series titled Chemo Glam. Um, in which I wanted to kind of strike the most vampy and vogue-like poses that I could associated with female beauty. Um, but when combined with the act of taking chemotherapy, they just become really grotesque in kind of so many different ways. Um, so I like to work with those ideas and the concept of fame as well, and all kind of tied up with the fact that art itself is really just an excess of sorts. Um, this is another one I did called my Chemoscape series. Um, and just again, kind of illustrating the larger than life quality of all of this that you have to go through. Um, so these are just kind of a couple uh, random pictures of work that I've done. And part of my practice is about direct documentation. Um, documentation of the diagnosis and the treatment and daily life of a young adult with cancer. Um, I have no real interest in hiding or disguising this experience. And, for newcomers like me, it's all really still strange and uh, really overwhelming. So a lot of the work that I do is kind of just trying to get an understanding of my new self and the situation that's been forced on me. Um, and a lot of it is just kind of viewing what is really pretty standard, medically speaking, but reframe it through um, my lens, which is a lens of extremes. Um, and that is it. And here is some of our contact info. Um, if you're interested, find us, friend us, follow us. Most of us are on Instagram. These are all of our websites. Um, leave us up. Feel free to take a screenshot or whatever. Um, we would love to hear from you or come back or talk more. Again, there's flyers outside. Please feel free to take one. And um, thank you so much for having us here today.